Okay, good morning. Uh, my name is Christine Denny and welcome to Grand Rounds. I am one of the Grand Rounds Committee co-directors along with Drs. Kate Elkington and Jeff Miller. We have a few announcements before we begin. In lieu of Grand Rounds next week on April 19th at 11 a.m., please join the Dean of the Vagilos College of Physicians and Surgeons, Dr. Katrina Armstrong, in person at 12.30 p.m. as she updates us on her priorities for the upcoming year and elicits feedback from members of the department. All staff, faculty, and trainees are strongly encouraged to attend in person. And again, just to repeat, there will be no grand rounds next week at 11 a.m. However, there will be a very special rounds with Dean Katrina Armstrong starting at 12.30 p.m. where will she be talking to members of the department and we hope to see you there. For today, I encourage everyone attending on Zoom to post questions at any time during the talk using the Q&A feature at the bottom of the Zoom window. This is separate from the chat. Please do not use the chat. If you are a trainee, please put the word trainee at the beginning of your question as we prioritize trainee questions. Please also write can ask question myself or prefer to have my question read at the end of your question. And if you are willing to ask your question yourself, I will temporarily promote you to panelists so you can ask the question directly to our speaker, camera on or off as you would prefer. I will now turn it over to Dr. Amy Margolis, who will speak about the DeHirsch Robinson Grand Rounds Endowed Lecture, and she will introduce our speaker today. Thank you, and Amy, take it over. Hi, thanks. Um, so welcome to the DeHirsch Robinson Grand Rounds. A little history about this lecture. In the 1989, the Kovner family endowed a gift to New York Presbyterian Hospital to extend the reach of pediatric psychiatry services to children in the local community who were coping with the challenge of dyslexia or other learning disabilities. Named after Katrina de Hirsch, who was a speech therapist um, who pioneered the field of childhood language and learning, the Grand Rounds is to be delivered by a distinguished expert in reading disorders and pediatric mental health. I should say reading disorders or learning disorders and pediatric mental health. The gift has uh, also supported our ongoing clinical research partnership with the Promise Project Clinic, where we continue the legacy of, of Katrina de Hirsch and provide close to 300 neuropsychological evaluations to children in need each year, as well as to conduct cutting edge research related to understanding the learning problems that youth who live in the context of economic disadvantage experience. So uh, this year we are thrilled to have Dr. David Geary as our speaker. Um, a little introduction about Dr. Geary. He received a BS from Santa Clara University uh, on a state of California scholarship for academically promising students from low income households. He then completed an MS in clinical child and school psychology from California State University and worked um, for the emergency treatment center in Palo Alto, California. During this time, he volunteered as a research assistant at Stanford School of Medicine and um, Based on these experiences, and luckily for our field, he decided to pursue a research career and has a PhD in developmental psychology from the University of California, Riverside. Flash forward, Dr. Geary has accumulated numerous awards and honors. He is the Curator's Distinguished Professor in the Department of Psychological Sciences and Interdisciplinary Neuroscience Program at the University of Missouri. His work spans topics ranging from, which we'll hear about today, children's mathematical cognition to the evolution of sex differences. He's written four sole authored books. He's published more than 325 articles and chapters across psychology, education, and biology. He served on the president's National Mathematics Advisory Panel and was appointed by President uh, G.W. Bush to the National Board of Advisors for the Institute of Educational Sciences. Among other honors, he's a fellow of the American Association of the Advancement of Science, a recipient of a Merit Award from the NIH, and a recipient of the G. Stanley Hall Award for Lifetime Distinguished Contributions to Developmental Psychology. I first had the pleasure of meeting Dr. Geary last year when we were invited as principal investigators of Learning Disability Innovation Hubs to Bethesda to present and share our work. I was fascinated to hear about his current research examining the development of mathematical thinking and risk for learning disabilities in math. 
I was so enthralled that we are now collaborating on a new project, and I hope that sometime in the not too distant future, we'll be able to share the fruits of that work as well. So I'm thrilled to turn this over to Dr. Geary and um, to share his brilliance and work with all of you. All right, thank you, Amy, appreciate it. Let me get the talk started here. So um, I'm going to uh, talk about a couple of projects, one that we finished and then one that we are just beginning the, uh, associated with the hub that um, Amy just mentioned. Um, the initial work was um, published, uh, was uh, funded by NSF and the uh, current work by um, the National Institutes of uh, Health. So I'm going to uh, focus on uh, the key findings of a four-year preschool to first grade longitudinal study. Um, <clears throat> the goal of this study, which, which we did a while back, was to identify the core early quantitative knowledge that predicts readiness for math learning in first grade. So <clears throat> basically trying to identify the preschool um, number counting and those sorts of competencies that are ready uh, that will later predict school readiness and risk of um, learning disabilities. Um, <clears throat> in this talk, I'll first uh, focus on the uh, core risk areas that we identified in this initial study, um, discuss some aspects of the developmental patterns in these areas, especially those that are predictive of um, readiness for math learning and um, risk. Uh, the, uh, and then I will work, uh, I'll, I'll discuss the, uh, the, innovative hub, the innovation hub and how it relates to this. The basic um, design is here is a four-year longitudinal study across three cohorts. We gave um, standardized math reading achievement assessments in each year two IQ tests, two executive control assessments in the first and second year of preschool, um, quantitative tasks that I will mention here in just a few minutes that um, we gave four times across two years, uh, once each semester, um, math cognition tests, and then we have um, first grade assessments. The first grade assessments are identical to those that we gave in a 10 year longitudinal study from kindergarten through ninth grade. And so we're able to link up um, the results from those two studies in ways that I will uh, discuss here in a bit. <clears throat> now we focus in, in this particular study and in the current um, innovation hub on title one kids. These are generally kids from low income families and considered to be at risk for long-term academic um, disability. So we just invite everybody who's enrolled in the program. Uh, so we had 232 uh, initially enroll, 35 we had to drop because they had trouble with the tasks or they moved or whatever. So the, the primary sample to talk about is almost 200 kids. Uh, they're about average in terms of um, IQ math achievement was a little below average, but still in the average range, although we had a fair number of kids who were low uh, in math and reading. Pretty diverse samples, about half white, half girls. The rest is a mix, uh, African-American, Hispanic, uh, Asian, mixed race, uh, a, a variety of, um, of uh, individuals. Uh, as you see here, um, it is primarily from a, a lower income sample. So 42% uh, are getting food stamps, 9% housing uh, assistance. They uh, had their first assessment on average about three years, nine months or so. So the, the big issue in, in question that, that kind of was the motivation for this task is, is that cognitive scientists had done um, a huge amount of work for decades, actually looking at the early number competencies of infants and you know one and two and three year old kids. So a lot was known about that. And then there was another group of folks who did a lot of work on um, 
uh, more formal mathematical development from kindergarten, but usually from first grade forward. But there wasn't really much um, tying those two literatures together. So there was a big gap uh, between them. And our goal was to really fill that gap, is to, to make a link between all this early um, infant cognition, preschool cognition work, and um, school readiness. And so the 12 quantitative tasks here are tasks that were designed by these early uh, cognition researchers. And so we, we sampled broadly in that. I'm not gonna go over, over all of those tasks here because uh, most of them aren't that important, but I'll focus on some key tasks. Um, one is, is the approximate number system. So there are a number of people who argue that, and, and reasonably so, that we have an evolved sensitivity to quantity that we can kind of estimate which is more, which is less. As in here, there are more blue dots or yellow dots. Um, overall area is controlled in, in this. So that uh, is important because many people believe that might be the seat of symbolic mathematical learning. <clears throat> Some other tasks that came out as um, important numeral identification, you just show them, you know, numbers one, two, three, uh, what's it called? Numeral comparison, which is larger, uh, five or two. How high can you count? Most of these kids can count to about 10 or 11 or so. Um, but they could go up to 100. Enumeration is actually, you have a set of objects in front of you and you're, you, you're pointing usually and counting um, each object once uh, to count correctly. The, the real critical, um, as, as we'll see, the, the real critical competency was something called cog, uh, cardinal knowledge. That is knowing the exact quantities represented by number words in our exam, in our uh, study here, but also the quantities associated with um, numerals. So the seems simple, uh, but the learning of uh, cardinal knowledge is actually protracted over, over many years. So children kind of learn by rote. There's a few mechanisms involved there. One, they know the word one stands for one object of any kind. Two, and then it takes them another six months or so on average to figure out what two means, and then three, so forth. Once they get up around four or so, they begin to generalize. So they don't have to learn five by rote or six by rote. They kind of get the idea that each successive number word represents one more quantity than the word uh, before it, although this uh, continues to, to develop. And th this is a very interesting um, evolutionarily novel skill. Uh, that is critical uh, for later math learning. So as, as I mentioned, uh, the, this is the first conceptual understanding of um, symbolic mathematics. So our first uh, analysis, or one of our first analysis, was to figure out, okay, which beginning of preschool uh, skills predicted end of year, end of the first year, standardized math achievement. So we had 12 uh, measures and we did a bunch of preliminary analyses to reduce those and to reduce false positives. Um, <clears throat> we included sensitivity of the approximate uh, sensitivity of the approximate number system in the analyses and, and uh, in fact focused on that initially because there were, were a number of studies showing that while well, it's correlated with math achievement and theoretically it might be the seat of um, symbolic math development. So we found that we replicated does in fact correlate with math achievement, but um, once we control for cardinal knowledge, um, it's no longer important. So that's the end of the first year. We did um, a follow-up on that particular analysis, pitting approximate number system against cardinal knowledge and through the end of um, preschool. So uh, two year at the end of two years, and confirm that it's really cardinal knowledge that's driving these individual differences in preschool math achievement. So um, the approximate number system does predict later math achievement, but it's not important once cardinal knowledge is controlled. In other analyses, we showed that approximate number system may contribute to learning of cardinal knowledge, but once they get that, it's not important. It's a conceptual understanding of numbers, not an evolved sensitivity that is important by, um, by our results. 
So in a uh, follow-up study, we looked at beginning of preschool quantitative predictors of end of preschool math achievement in the um, initial analyses I just mentioned. We're focused on the approximate number system. And now we're looking at the entire range of, of um, competencies that kids have. Um, we went through a series of um, you know, fancy statistics, Bayesian sorts of things and um, other analyses to reduce the set of possible predictors down um, in order to reduce false positives. We didn't want to get any false um, results there. Um, we came up with a cardinal principle knower kind of categorical variable. So we contrast six knowers, kids who knew um, all their well, what all the numbers meant at the beginning of preschool. Um, we contrasted those with one knowers, two knowers, three knowers, and four knowers. And again, the difference between one and two could be six months or so. So it, it, it's not a clear thing uh, to three-year-olds and four-year-olds and to get from two to three is another six months and three to four could be another six months um, or so. So the, the key findings are here. Uh, we had more variables and as, as I said, we, we used a number of preliminary analyses to reduce those and, and kind of get that down to a manageable um, number. So controlling for age, boys and girls, the um, contrast with college and high school and all that is basically controlling for parental education. Uh, the variable being predicted here is standardized achievement scores at the end of um, preschool. And the um, key findings here are that uh, one knowers and two knowers were in the uh, first analysis here, um, you know, 0.575 or 0.4 standard deviations below uh, kids who are cardinal principal knowers at the beginning of preschool. Um, the first analyses um, had uh, letter recognition as a predictor in there, and the second one had numeral recognition. They were highly correlated, so they couldn't go in the same regression, but, but uh, the results are the same. Um, kids who only knew one or two when they started preschool were already significantly behind um, cardinal principal knowers before they even uh, entered preschool. Uh, we also found that verbal counting, kind of how many number words you knew, one, two, three, four, five, and so forth, was important. And ordinal comparison is just a kind of understanding of more or less uh, there. But but the cardinal principle results came out as um, uh, actually surprisingly strong. So then we um, thought, you know, then we finished the, the data collection through the end of um, uh, first grade. We thought, does it matter when kids become cardinal principal knowers? Now, it could be that these one and two knowers at the beginning of um, preschool, yeah, they're, they're behind at the end of preschool, but maybe it, do, it doesn't matter in the long run. Maybe they catch up during kindergarten and um, all, all is well. So th the question is, is knowing uh, you know, the cardinal values of number words, uh, if you know it by kindergarten, is that good enough? And that was essentially the belief in the field at that time. And, and you know, it seemed like a reasonable belief uh, to me as well. But it's always good to, to uh, collect data and see if that's actually the case. So of the 197 kids, 141 of them completed all or nearly all of the um, assessments. So we use those uh, in this analysis. Uh, the table here looks, it shows the um, tasks that, that we used in, in these analyses in one way or another. Um, the red is the given number. And what's important here is um, the assessment at which they became cardinal principal knowers. So if they got, you know, one, two, they knew all the, all the number words at the uh, beginning of preschool, then their age of becoming cardinal principal knower was three years, 10 months. If they got at the end of the, of the first year, then four years, two months, and so forth. 
And if they got it at the end of preschool, five years, two months, and there's about 10% of them didn't get it at all. So we had kids who were um, uh, did not understand numbers even after two years of preschool. And in first grade, we gave uh, three uh, tasks, addition strategy, number sets, number line, basically number processing sorts of things where we can extract out a number of variables. As I said, these tests were identical to those that we gave in our 10-year longitudinal study. Uh, and we, we gave the same tests and the same, about the same age and, and so forth. Now that's important <clears throat> because a composite of those tests, which we call number system knowledge, at the beginning of first grade uh, in our other study predicted employment rele relevant math competencies um, in adolescence. And it predicted better than math achievement tests. So what we did there is we looked at what labor economists use to predict employability, wages, and so forth in uh, young adults. We put together a bunch of measures that um, assess these employment relevant types of things, gave them to them, the kids in um, middle school. And then we looked at what predicted, you know, what school entry skills predicted uh, this later performance. And this composite, this number system knowledge predicted, even when you control for parental background, ethnic background, sex, um, IQ, uh, working memory, executive functions, uh, even standardized math achievement still predicts above and beyond that. So it's a it's an important measure and has um, long-term external validity to it. So again, we used a, a variety of fancy stats types of things to just kind of um, reduce risks of false positives. So we looked at age of becoming card cardinal principal knower. So they were, they got four or five or six on the um, tasks that we, we gave for that. And once you get around four, you begin to generalize and, and you, you tend to get the other numbers as well. And we looked at those that compared those that achieved it either, you know, the first assessment, second, third, or fourth assessment relative to kids who didn't achieve it at all. Uh, we included a number of other factors, the approximate number system, we included in there just for theoretical reasons, because people think it's important. The object comparison, a more or less sort of thing, verbal counting, numeral recognition. And we looked at um, start of preschool scores and then the gains uh, that they had on these tasks from the beginning to the um, end of preschool. Um, control for domain general predictors, executive functions. We gave two assessments of that. We had two IQ assessments. We looked at um, pre-literacy sorts of things, controlled that and so forth. You, you always have to control for these things uh, in these studies. And then you know, we, we reduced these set of predictors down, um, added control preschool math achievement. I'll, I'll show you the results here in a second. And then did everything to make sure we're not missing it. And then we looked at the convergent and discriminant validity of our results by uh, looking at whether age becoming a cardinal principle knower is predicted like reading achievement. So the, the core results are here. Um, the first sets of columns there are basically, once we did the Bayesian and all the other analyses, there was only a few key predictors of number system knowledge, and they were the, uh, the ones you see here, progressive matrices, that's uh, nonverbal IQ, um, numeral recognition and gains there were there. The important things are shown in red. So kids who were cardinal principal knowers when they started preschool had a standard deviation advantage over kids who didn't get it by the end of preschool um, on this number system knowledge test. And kids who got it by the end of the first year of preschool were about the same. Now, it could be that, well, we're just picking up, um, you know, just general math achievement there and it's not cardinal principle knowledge per se and so we added into preschool standardized math achievement into um, the prediction equation here 
And we'll see that the effect on uh, age of becoming a cardinal principle lower, it's a little lower, but it's not much lower. It goes from 0.107 to 0.92, essentially standard deviation advantage. And then we threw in everything, uh, well, just about everything that, that could potentially be alternative explanations, parental, educational background, nonverbal, verbal intelligence, executive functions, so forth. And we still see that age of becoming a cardinal principal knower, it actually gets a little bigger now, is still about a standard deviation uh, difference. So these kids who know this early on or acquire it at the beginning of preschool have a huge advantage on this number system knowledge uh, measure uh, at the beginning of first grade. And kids who pick up cardinal principal knowledge by the end of preschool aren't any better than kids on this number system task uh, than kids who don't get it at all. So you really have to have this understanding by about four years or so. So then, well, it could be that, oops, that the cardinal principle um, task is just picking up general academic achievement types of things. And if that's the case, then age of becoming cardinal principle knower should be related, should predict word reading skills. Um, and so we did have a word reading measure at the end of kindergarten. And so we put the same predictors in there, letter recognition predicted it, which is a common finding and um, uh, end of math, uh, end of preschool math achievement predicted it. But you see that none of the results are for cardinal principle knowledge, age of becoming a cardinal principle knower are significant. So the, the developmental timing of this is related to math stuff, number knowledge at beginning of, uh, schooling, but is not related to reading. And then we looked at numerical operations, which is a standard math achievement test, and we get similar results. Um, <clears throat> knowing it early is really important. Knowing it a little later um, didn't come out significant here. Um, and one reason for that, as I said before, is the number system knowledge composite is actually uh, a better indicator of individual differences in early number development than a standardized math achievement test. So these things predict later outcomes better than standardized math achievement. So the basic finding is that kids who are cardinal principal knowers by about four years of age um, before starting preschool or early in the first year have about a one standard deviation advantage on the number system knowledge task at the beginning of first grade. This is controlling for IQ, prior achievement, executive functions, parental education, and we did other analyses to rule out other things as well. So that is a huge gap between kids who are really ready for learning uh, when they enter first grade and those that are uh, behind. In our previous 10-year study, we showed that Kids who, who are low on number system knowledge at the beginning of first grade, they do gain in this knowledge over time, but they, they never close the gap. So age of um, becoming a cardinal principal knower unrelated to reading achievement, demonstrating discriminant validity of this measure was related to later math achievement, though less strongly than to number system knowledge. And that's, again, as I said, because the number system tasks actually more sensitive to um, individual variation in uh, early math competencies. So the implication is uh, children's understanding of symbolic mathematics accelerates after becoming a cardinal principle knower. In other words, getting cardinal principle knowledge early um, is related to the later sophistication of your number knowledge, suggesting that um, the age at which you acquire this kind of is the start point for learning more complex relations among um, numbers, or it's sometimes called number sense. So <clears throat> to test this, um, we did a uh, follow-up study. We looked at the relation between age of becoming a cardinal principle knower and um, numeral comparison performance. So whether knowing five is, represents more than uh, the numeral three does. 
Now that's a very simple task, but it turns out in older kids, meaning early elementary school years, uh, speed of number comparison, accuracy of number comparison is a stronger predictor of later math achievement than the approximate number system acuity. So basically speed of num numerical uh, numeral comparisons is a good indicator of uh, the long-term memory representations of numeral uh, number relationships and conceptual understanding of numbers. Simple task, but is very uh, predictive of um, early, early math development. So numeral comparison is the early stage of learning this number sense, these relations among um, numbers. So with the um, numeral comparison tasks, kids were initially just randomly presented 15 numerals. Uh, which ones did they know the names of? And if they knew one to five, but didn't know any of the others, then we only used one to five in the uh, numeral comparison task. So they got a number of trials on that. And in the plots here, in the upper plots, we see, um, percent correct for the numeral comparison task. In the lower plots, we see percent correct on the approximate, so this evolved uh, sensitivity to quantity task. And the uh, dashed line is, um, uh, anything above the dashed line is statistically uh, better than chance. The uh, dark, you know, the, the, the top line there, is the uh, numeral comparison performance of the kids who are cardinal principal knowers at the beginning of preschool, the dash red at the end of the first year, the blue at the beginning of the second year, and the green the end of the um, second year. <clears throat> and so we see here uh, that the uh, kids who are cardinal principal knowers at the beginning of the year were better on all of the tasks, or, or better on numeral comparison throughout schooling and so forth. No, no big deal there. All of the kids uh, were above guessing, above chance on the approximate number system task um, from the beginning of preschool forward, which makes sense if it's an, an evolved intuitive sort of task. The, the important component here is um, in uh, panels B and D. And what I did there was align the kids based on the assessment in which they became, became cardinal principal knowers. So if they became cardinal principal knowers on the third assessment, which is the beginning of the second year of preschool, then negative one would be the second assessment, the end of the first year, negative two would be the beginning of preschool, and one would be the end of the second year. And once we align them on age at which they become cardinal principal knowers, as you'll see, their performance on the number comparison task is now not statistically significantly different. So once they become cardinal principal knowers, they really uh, begin to understand the relationships between the quantities represented by numerals. Um, they also showed gains in the approximate number system task, but the slope of increase is much higher for the uh, number system uh, for the numeral comparison task than for the other task. Um, we did some other analyses, basically showed that um, the kids understand, you know, kids integration of their inherent sense of quantity with their processing of symbolic numbers and numerals really only occurs or at least accelerates after they become cardinal principal knowers. So the direction of the relationship is not from the approximate number system to symbolic mathematics. It's symbolic mathematics is, is helping kids to integrate this intuitive sense of relative um, quantity afterwards, kind of the exact opposite of what people had thought in the field up to that time. So, and we also looked at um, kids who were um, uh, doing poorly on the standardized achievement test, so high risk of math uh, learning disability. 
<clears throat> so generally, if kids are below the 25th percentile in um, on a standardized math achievement test, it's like, well, you need to look at them. There may be some uh, risk there. If they perform poorly on a math achievement test uh, one time, that doesn't necessarily mean they have uh, cognitive issues or learning disability um, issues. We found that you know sometimes kids have bad days and they have one bad score doesn't mean anything. But if they have more than one low score, relatively low score, then these kids are, are the ones that seem to have the longer term issues. So we looked at kids who were below the 25th percentile in both preschool years. And we compared them with typically achieving kids um, that probably would have been, I think, 40th to 60th percentile in there, um, in that range for both preschool assessments and at the end of first grade. And um, something that we didn't expect uh, came up here. We found that some of the kids who were um, low in uh, both preschool assessments were actually fine at the end of first grade or largely fine at the end of first grade. So we call those kids recovered. So both the math learning disability group and the recovered group both had low math achievement scores in preschool, as you'll see here at the seventh and 10th percentile for the one group and 10th and 12th percentile for the other group. But these recovered kids were at the 49th percentile. They were fine at the um, end of first grade, or largely fine at the end of first grade, but the learning disabled kids stayed below the 10th percentile on average. One of the, the predictors of that was preschool gains in executive functions. So the ability to kind of maintain focused attention and to switch rules and tasks and um, you know conceptually switch from one thing to another and inhibit prepotent responses. Um, we see that the uh, learning disabled and the recovered kids are all below average, below the typically achieving kids um, in the first year, but the re recovered kids had had shown dramatic improvement um, over the the, the course of the year. And it wasn't just that they had a bad assessment during the first preschool years, because they did poorly the first year on a lot of things, but showed a lot of gains um, over the course of um, the two years. So the, the recovered students had substantive gains in executive functions, and they showed um, gains in cardinal principle, uh, more steeper gains in cardinal principle knowledge and a few other things, but especially cardinal principle knowledge relative to the math learning disability um, kids. Um, I'm not showing it here, but the re recovered kids still had some subtle deficits on the number system knowledge tasks. They probably has some memory deficits in terms of memorizing basic facts and a few other things, but overall um, they were doing much better than you would expect uh, based on their preschool math achievement. So the core finding of this initial study is that cardinal knowledge is the, really seems to be the linchpin to early math development. An age of acquiring this conceptual insight is critical. It is kind of the um, stop point. It, if you don't get cardinal pr principle knowledge, before you get cardinal principle knowledge, everything you learn, counting, um, number words, and so forth, is basically rote. There's no conceptual basis to it. The conceptual understanding is only emerging after you kind of get it, that these number words actually represent quantities in a very systematic um, systematic way. So we found uh, in this other, uh, in the study I just discussed, there's at least a two-year gap between early and late cardinal principle knowers. Huge difference. I mean, th these are just three and four-year-olds. Um, and we know this gap is going to make a big difference when they enter schooling. The kids that are behind in the beginning of first grade tend to stay behind throughout uh, schooling. And that kind of starting behind 
can be traced to it, at least by our study here, to this early uh, cardinal principle knowledge. <clears throat> so we need to figure out why and eventually move, you know, close that gap. So the late cardinal principle knowers, we can move forward by a year or so, hopefully. Um, so the LD hub, which, which we're now um, working on, takes a multi-systemic approach. And we're focused on cardinal knowledge and supporting number competencies such as enumeration, verbal counting, and so forth. In the prior study, we had a wide range of things we were um, assessing. We narrowed that down to a handful of core things. And now we're focused in terms of number development on those core things. Um, but we're taking a multi-systemic approach. We know from other studies that you can do child-centered interventions and improve knowledge and skills um, pretty significantly, but you get fade out effects. So they don't, they're not working long-term. So we have to think differently about this, take a different approach um, to it. So we have a child-centered approach as with the original study, home-centered and classroom-centered factors. And we're going to look at all their um, interactions and try to figure out what combination of things is contributing to this two-year gap in cardinal principle uh, knowledge. Uh, we're hoping to recruit 150 or maybe even more kids and their families from the same Title I program as in the prior study. Uh, we have a great relationship with the, uh, with the schools. They're all on board on this. This is what we're doing. We have quantitative tasks. It looks like a lot, but verbal counting, you know, count from one to start counting as high as you can. They, most of them get to 12, so that takes 30 seconds to do that. And the other tasks go pretty quickly as well. So we're, we're getting a lot, but it's not as burdensome on the kids as look. Domain general skills, executive functions, we measure several times. Uh, working memory, IQ, standard math achievement. We're going into the classrooms. We'll have three observations on each kid um, each year. We're looking at in-class attentive behavior. We're also looking at what the teacher is focusing on uh, during that time. The teachers are also gonna report on kids' hyperactivity, uh, in-class attentive behavior, and on the content of their classes. We're doing a very thorough home assessment. Um, Parents are getting math anxiety, math attitude assessments. We're assessing their verbal and nonverbal reasoning abilities. We're giving them standardized math and reading um, assessments, not just asking them how good they are at math or whatever. We're actually doing standardized assessments. We get demographic information. Um, we're doing a family home environment assessment, which is a lot of developmental folks do that, looking at the overall um, uh, supportiveness of the home. Uh, there's a child parent number task. They're doing a birthday task, which will elicit number talk. So we're doing um, that as well and a number of, of other things. So we have quite a, quite a bit of um, data that we're um, collecting. We're going to look at um, complex number development. So that would be um, cardinal principle knowledge for numerals, number words, and numeral comparison types of things. And this is just a brief schematic of, um, we're going to look at uh, exposure to complex numbers at home, math language, child characteristics, um, in-class behavior, and look at how that is related to and how it might influence um, complex number development. The red arrows, um, suggest possible bi-directional uh, relationships that I'll show you here um, in, in just a second. So one of our planned analyses, we'll look at um, kids' complex number um, competencies in the first year and the second year, latent variable defined by these, these tasks here. Then we'll look at uh, parental factors to look at um, exposure to um, uh, the kids exposure to complex number information at home that that includes the parent child math talk task so kind of what's the complexity of 
the, the talk that um, the kids are getting uh, from their parents. And um, we will look for things like child evocative effect. So it could be that kids who have pretty understanding of uh, number in the first year of preschool uh, will also have a pretty good understanding in the second year, but it could also be that parents adapt their uh, the complexity of the number of information that they present to their kids as they're discussing things um, based on child's prior knowledge. So we would develop there a feedback loop. So kids who are a little bit ahead, uh, their parents adjust, give them more complex information, more sophisticated talk, which it further accelerates uh, their early advantages. Or could be the other way around where, where kids who don't know much, the parents just kind of pull, pull back and don't really engage much in number talk, which would exaggerate um, the early differences that we found in the um, initial study. All right, I've got a couple minutes left, so I'll wrap it up. So there, there is an inherent sensitivity to quantity. It's found across uh, species, very well replicated. The brain systems involved in it are reasonably well known and so forth. It is correlated with math achievement and there has been a big push by um, a number of labs to suggest that it is the, the foundation for symbolic math achievement, which, which is one of the reasons we included it in our initial study. Um, but we're just not finding evidence for that, meaning that you know you can focus on this, but it may not produce the long-term results that um, we hope to get. Um, rather, it appears that uh, it's a kid's understanding of cardinality that is the key um, to early learning and preparation for uh, formal mathematics. This is really interesting for a number of ways, not, not only empirically and practically, but it's unique to humans. Um, you can teach chimps and other great apes, uh, even, even uh, monkeys, to um, understand what the numeral one represents, and the numeral two and three and four and five and so forth. But you have to teach each of those separately and with thousands and thousands of trials. Even with thousands of trials, they never generalize to the next number. Everything is a rote learning sort of thing. So this conceptual understanding that number words and numerals represent unique quantities is, is really interesting. Um, it's kids' first mathematical induction, you know, the beginning of number theory, so to speak, and um, continues to be elaborated for um, many years up, up through at least uh, kindergarten, first grade. Um, learning the cardinal value of individual words and numerals is a first step in learning the relations among number symbols and uh, the number system knowledge that predicts long-term outcomes. Uh, again, as I said, learning the relations among uh, numerals that uh, a seven is the same as a five and a two and a four and a three or a six and a one and so forth, understanding that numbers can be de decomposed and manipulated and that nine is more than um, seven and seven is more than three. And, and those sorts of things are, those all become integrated into a system of number knowledge or number sense that predicts concurrent and later long-term math outcomes. <clears throat> and what we found is cardinal knowledge predicts this, this number system knowledge. So I think our real critical finding here is that individual differences at the beginning of preschool. So these are, you know, not even four-year-olds, three years, nine months, 10 months or so, is related to their trajectory of number learning, um, learning numerals and the relations among them, and readiness for school math. So these differences are already evident um, at least two years, and, and it must be. Uh, more than two years before the beginning of kindergarten. The basic prior assumption that, well, as long as you get it by kindergarten, you're good, um, is, is just not correct. Uh, the factors contributing to this early variation in number knowledge are not well understood at all. Uh, there are a number of studies that look at home factors, um, 
you know, parents counting to kids and reported number of activities and so forth. And it's not straightforward. Um, there's not a straightforward relation between what parents do at home and what kids understand. Although there is something there. It, it, it's just counting to your kids isn't going to do it. It takes more complex um, number activities like comparing sets of things that is really important. So our, our focus is on identifying these factors. Um, we're looking, taking a multi-systemic approach, looking at child factors like their executive functions um, and their prior number knowledge, doing a very, very thorough assessment of the home environment and the parents' um, skills. What do the parents bring to these interactions um, with kids? And we're getting information from teachers, we're observing teachers, we're observing kids in classrooms. And so we're going to look at all of these factors in their interactions. And we hope that this will set us up for, um, you know, uh, uh, help us target uh, or help us develop a multi-systemic intervention. We, we know just working with kids directly helps, but it doesn't help in the long term. We're probably going to have to do um, interventions focused on parent knowledge, maybe parent anxiety or whatever. Um, changes in preschool math curriculum, I'm, I'm certain is going to have to happen. It's going to need to be more focused than it is now and a little more, more complex. Oops. And I guess that's it.